good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good whatever time you're listening to this podcast. My name is James Alban and you're listening to The Last Line. Hope you're all having a wonderful week. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're new to the show, then please do hit subscribe, follow us on iTunes. And if you're feeling extra generous, then head over to patreon.com forward slash The Last Line and give me some of your hard-earned money uh, where you'll be adequately rewarded for doing so. This week I speak to American journalist David Nywert. Um, David, who used to work at msnbc.com where he won a National Press Club Award, is now a freelance journalist and blogger. He's written uh, several books. Uh, His latest, Alt America, The Rise of the Radical Right in the Age of Trump, came out in 2017. And he is a contributing writer for the Southern Poverty Law Center's blog, Hate Watch, um, which is uh, fairly self-explanatory in in its title, really. It's uh, watching out for far-right hate groups and reporting on them. I spoke to David around a month ago uh, where we discussed all things from the radical right uh, to conspiracy theorists, which is what David's uh, latest project is about. But first, we talked about Alex Jones and the recent news that he had been blocked from Spotify, iTunes, and YouTube. I guess one thing, actually, uh, to start us off, um, did you have you seen um, in the news today um, about Alex Jones? Oh yeah, uh, and, and good day for me. Get, yeah, getting taken off iTunes and Spotify and. YouTube, I think, as well, like some of the influencer stuff been taken yep. off YouTube. I guess I kind of wanted to get your take on that because that's kind of mm-hmm. timely considering I'm talking to you. Sure. Um, well, for me, the day the Alex Jones disappears from the internet is really a good day for all of us because um, uh, he's severely polluting the information stream and he's making it. Uh, He's one of the main contributors to the problem that we have with our public discourse, the fact that we can't have a public uh, or a civil discourse anymore because uh, there's so many people who've gone down his little rabbit hole and and are, um, you know, uh, they, they call themselves being red-pilled, um, you know, when they, when they sort of subscribe to his uh, conspiracy theories, right? Yeah. And um, but it's it, we're seeing you know uh, all around the world we're seeing all kinds of toxic effects from this because it means increasing numbers of people are fully embracing and believing these um, a factual theories that actually have no real basis in reality. Um, so it's um, you know, and it, it, one of the re- one of the, this has multiple pro- uh, problems. Of course, it's a problem for democracy because we can't have a civil discourse, you know, a normal discourse based on facts and logic and reason, where we can have a, a back and forth and kind of reach a democratic conclusion. Um, and it's also a problem within. You know, families uh, and friends, people who go down this rabbit hole, um, you know, they're frequently very paranoid and fearful. And then, uh, you know, I'm covering a trial this fall of the guy who called himself Seattle for Truth, a guy named Lane Davis, who murdered his father because he had gone down this rabbit hole, the Pizzagate rabbit hole, right? Mm. And, uh, you know, um, and then finally, it's, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it actually has an unhinging effect on people. The guy who murdered all those people in Las Vegas uh, with the, from the top of that hotel tower was a subscriber to conspiracy theories. And he had basically just become unhi- unhinged by yeah. going down this rabbit hole. Do you think, um, because I was like you when I saw that article this morning, I was like, it it was, you know, it was a sort of punch the air sort of moment. Yes. Um, That was what Alex was doing, by the way. There's a a, a chip of him on 
on Twitter uh, being angry over this, and he's like shaking his fist in the air at uh, <laughs> at the unjustness of being taken off Facebook. Um, do you, I did wonder, like, do you think it 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 sort of it adds flame to their fire in a way? Sure. I, yeah, well, of course they're good at that. I mean, that's part of their deal, right? They always claim they're being oppressed. That, mm. I, I mean, that's that's actually part of their selling point is that they're selling uh, suppressed information that the government, that the deep state doesn't want out, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and um, it, it, they'll always do that. So at this point, I'm like, okay, go ahead, whatever. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't worry about... Uh, them being able to make that claim because they'll make that claim anyway. Right, um, yeah. And um, it, at this point, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, they can claim that it's free speech, but the reality is it's just like Lauren Southern going down to Australia and New Zealand and claiming that their speech is being censored. censored. Well, you know, um, Actually, especially in New Zealand, because they basically got no platform in New Zealand. And yeah. um, but the reality is, I mean, I'm going down to Australia and New Zealand in a couple of weeks and I am being platformed at these book events. But because you know what? I wrote a book that people want to hear about. And, <laughs> and, and it's based on and I've been a reporter for 30 years and it's based on that 30 years of reporting. Um, so they, they're uh, very much. They don't understand that that uh, nobody uh, – I mean, free speech is one thing uh, because what yeah. free speech is about is the government uh, being able to tell people what they can and can't say. And that has nothing to do with what happened in New Zealand. Free, it's not the – just because you have free speech doesn't mean that you're owed these platforms. You know, nah. it doesn't, otherwise I should be on the freaking New York Times, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, I could make the same complaint that guys like Kevin McBully or Kevin Williams make that, you know, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm in the United States, especially, I tend to get, um, overlooked and ignored by a lot of the mainstream media because the stuff that I'm saying makes them very uncomfortable. And you know what? I don't complain. That it's a, that I'm losing my free speech because I understand how the media system works. It's nobody owes you a platform. Uh, nobody yeah. owes, especially if they. Nobody in the media, you're not owed a, a spot in that magazine or in that newspaper. You actually have to earn that right by writing something that people want to read. And it's their choice at the end of the day. It's not. Yeah. It's you know it's a, it's corporate. It, it, yeah, it's that it, you know Facebook don't. Oh, mm -hmm. Alex Jones, anything. Facebook um, and, and Twitter. If anything, Alex Jones probably owes Facebook something for <laughs> building his fan base for, for him well, in a way. Well, actually, it, that, that's very true. But, of course, the, re the sad reality is one of the reasons that YouTube's been very reluctant uh, to do anything about this is that they, in fact, have profited a great deal. Mm. Uh, from the kind of traffic that Alex Jones generates. So um, that's, which is part of the problem, but at least they woke up uh, and recognized that, no, this is having a really toxic effect. We'll see how long and how well it lasts that he is off the platform. But Lord knows, I mean, when uh, I'm working on a project this fall. My next book actually is going to be an attempt to uh, tackle the plague of conspiracy theories that we're undergoing. And there's just seriously no question that one of the real reasons uh, that we're having this plague, that we're uh, being inundated with all these, is that it, they've become enormously popular on YouTube. And YouTube is one of the main ways uh, that young people are gaining their news and information. Um, yeah. People aren't reading as much anymore, so guys like me aren't as popular. So I, um, it's interesting you say that about people getting their news on Facebook because I guess I'm so because I'm 23, so <laughs> I'm of the age bracket where Instagram. Yeah. You know, people my age are the people getting their news off YouTube and Facebook mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I have a seventeen-year-old, so I observe this. Yeah, um, and it's it is worrying 
how many people I know that get into conspiracy theories because of videos they've watched off YouTube and and the idea that that you'll trust someone on a YouTube video more than you'll trust Didn't someone who is an expert on something you know you know what I mean like 911 is a good example of you have all these structural engineer engineers explaining why the buildings could be brought down in the way they were brought down yeah well but one guy on YouTube and it's like and it also you, explains the rise of these really kind of marginal thinkers like Jordan Peterson, right? So I was going to ask you about Jordan Peterson actually cuz he seems to be like everywhere at the well, moment. Well, he essentially appeals I mean what what I think he very much is part of is this uh, rising tide of authoritarianism that we're seeing. Uh, he's not he's not explicitly alt right or white nationalist or even openly bigoted that I can tell. Uh, but I do think he's a fraud. Uh, you know, I have seen him claim that he's uh, a member of the Kwa Kwa Kwak tribe, even though he is of Scottish descent. <laughs> Trust me, you can cannot become a member of the Kwa Kwa Kwak tribe unless you are descended from someone of um, who was born at Kwak Kwak Kwak. Uh, and it's also extremely ironic that he would do this. You know, one of P Peterson's main shticks is that he is, you know, all about the patriarchy, mm. right? This is why I consider him part of this tide of authoritarianism. Uh, that, you know, we should return to sort of a traditional patriarchy and that, you know, the, the, that multiculturalism has been a disaster and so on and so forth. Well, it's obvious that even though he claims membership in this tribe, this is actually in anthropological circles. This is an extremely famous tribe for being the people that the Franz Boas, the father of modern multiculturalism, father of modern anthropology, uh, studied in the 1890s uh, and gave their his studies of them gave him the ideas to uh, uh, basically tear down the old sort of Dar Darwinian hierarchy that was the uh, popular view of the normal you know it was mm. sort of pre eugenics view of how we were supposed to have you know it, it was it, in the 1890s and 1900s it was popularly believed that. The, the ultimate evolution of human society was a white male patriarchy. <laughs> and, um, and he began to seriously doubt that. And, and a lot of the reasons that he did had to do with his studies of the Kwa Kwa Kwa, who had uh, matrilineal lines and occasionally women chiefs. Right. So... You know, uh, uh, it, to me, it's astonishing that uh, Peterson would um, claim a membership in a tribe that was actually famous for having helped give birth to multiculturalism. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but it's also that's also perfectly in line. You know, I heard him say things about how well humans and lobsters have a common yeah, ancestor. Yeah, I saw that. Well, well if it, if you're if you're at all familiar with evolutionary biology, you know that that is a complete and utter yeah. non sequitur. Yeah, somewhere back in the primordial soup, humans and lobsters had a common ancestor back because you know what, <laughs> lobsters are invertebrates. <laughs> it was our vertebrates, and and during the, that was one of the primary you know points in evolution back in the primordial soup when. Uh, vertebrates uh, evolved from invertebrates, yeah. you know, it's like, um, so yeah, it, it, it is, it, anyone who actually understands and appreciates science and biology would know, well, that's completely irrelevant. It means has nothing to do with whatever sort of common neurological answers. I mean, I actually make the argument uh, in my book of, of, that I wrote about killer whales that, you know, uh, I didn't say we had a common ancestor, although I expect we do somewhere. Uh, but rather, uh, I just made the point that, you know, the human morphology and brain structure is similar enough uh, that we should possibly look at what they do because they've 
uh, if we want to survive long term because these are animals that have been atop the food chain for six million years and they're extraordinarily intelligent. Uh, how are they able to succeed where we're looking at running off the edge of the cliff? Yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, it has a lot to do with empathy and that sort of thing. But at any rate, uh, th those are the kinds of things that I think you can say legitimately. But to, to try to claim that we should follow, we should imitate the behavior of lobsters because we have a common ancestor with them is... I is beyond yeah it, it's, it's a it's a stretch isn't it it's a bit of a stretch yeah 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 so anyway i have always thought of him as a fraud and mostly uh, i see him as uh part of this uh tide of authoritarianism where he gets young white males uh to uh fall into a culture where they believe everybody else should submit to them and uh, this inevitably kind of goes down to the pat event. You know, you follow that logic far enough down that rabbit hole and it becomes incels, right? Yeah. Involuntary cells. So. Um, why do you think he appeals to people like white males my age, like so much? He seems so fatherly and wise and, and, and yet he's also running... Part of it is that he's running a, a a line, a narrative past them that contradicts the sort of standard uh, pattern they've been raised with, right. right? And so that has an appeal, especially to to males. Males, uh, it's the same way they like fart jokes, you know, <laughs> it's the transgressive humor. Uh, they like to rebel, especially when they're in their late teens and early 20s. Um, I was no different, frankly. This this may be a very short answer from you, because I'm imagining I know what you're going to say. But are there any conspiracies that you do, uh, conspiracy theories that haven't yet been proved necessarily? Like obviously, there are you know like Watergate to an extent was a you know was oh, a, yeah. a conspiracy, um, but any that you believe in? Yeah. Well, no, the, here, it's actually really simple uh, matter, to, and this is part of my project that I'm going to try. You know, mostly I want to help give people the tools for understanding and coping with conspiracies or conspiracy theories. It's very, there are real conspiracies mm -hmm. in history, always have been, uh, but it's actually very easy to distinguish them from uh, the fantasies that are conspiracy theories. The first is, and mainly that there are three basic criteria that distinguish them. Um, it has to do with the limitations of, of, of real world conspiracies. Real world conspiracies, the ones that are actually very real, mm. are very limited in time. They're very limited in scope. And they're limited in the numbers of actors, okay. the numbers of participants. Um, the uh, any conspiracy theory that doesn't that falls outside those boundaries is probably about ninety nine percent certain to be uh, ridiculous okay. or, or 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 you know um, of, of dubious value. Right. Uh, and um, but but if it falls within those criteria, then it's always entirely indeed possible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just like the the protocols of the Ze seven elders of Zion, probably the hoariest of the current lot of conspiracy theories, or the one that preceded that, the Illuminati conspiracy theory, which was actually generated, you know, by uh, royalists, people, and monarchists, people who uh, the old Illumina Illuminati conspiracy theory was actually – a, a sort of propaganda effort uh, against the Enlightenment. Oh, really? Uh, I don't know. I, if, know I don't know if you knew no, that. Yes, yeah, it's got quite a history. Yeah, and uh, it was concocted by monarchists who wanted people to remain loyal to the king and and wanted to stop this uh, frightening democracy trend that they were seeing. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, that's interesting. 
roots. Yeah, so it has it has roots. Conspiracism has roots in really probably the worst of our politics, and um, you know the in the twentieth century the oldest and probably. Uh, most pernicious of them all was the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories around the Protocols of Seven Elders of Zion, um, which we you see perfect, almost perfectly replicated in its architecture in the modern-day cultural Marxism theory. That is a secret cabal of uh, nefarious Jews uh, who sits around and comes up with ideas uh, for means to destroy. Uh, Western white civilization, right? That was what Protocols was about, and that's what cultural Marxism is about. So, um, and all in all of these, it, it entails, you know, the, in order for these conspiracies to actually work, you know, you have to have hundreds, of, even thousands of participants. Uh, they're taking place over extremely long, over decades and generations, and uh, they are, um, you know, there's, they basically want to rule the world, <laughs> you know. So that's pretty unlimited in scope, pretty unlimited in time, and pretty uh, unlimited in the numbers of actors. So really, those three, three criteria really are how you can best distinguish. Okay, what yeah, because that, that, make, that makes sense, because, all, all, you know, actually most, uh, as, in an interesting way, a sort of, knew those three things without knowing them, if you see what I mean. That, like, there are three rules, there are three simple rules that make sense because they're the arguments I always use when people come up with conspiracies about the moon right. landings or whatever. It's like, well, how many people right. do you yeah. think were involved in, in how many years have they kept this secret going back and forth? To the... So it right. makes sense when you boil it down to those three things. Um, yeah. I actually... Uh, stop dating a girl because she said she believed in the moon landing conspiracy and that that was like uh i can't anymore i can't yeah i can't go there i can't yeah what you know have fun (laughs) (laughs) a nice life it's amazing how something like that changes your uh view on someone which well sure but you what you realize is that they're vulnerable to um really toxic thinking and um they can drag you down with them so you know if you're not willing to i mean if she had if you'd gotten to the point in the relationship where she meant a lot to you and then you discovered this you know it is can be worth the effort to try to pull them out of the rabbit hole but a lot of times you get sucked down at yourself yeah so yeah i mean i don't want to you know it, it wasn't the sole reason and it was quite early on right. but it was a, it was definitely a factor it was like huh you know it was it, it it made you think um yes do you know much about uh tommy robinson i don't know if he's really a figure that yeah. sort of translates over to the states or not but yeah tommy's uh Tommy's, you know, a classic case of uh, what he actually is a classic case of is this very cynical manipulation of free speech rights that we're seeing from the right. Uh, He's claiming that, you know, he's doing this on behalf of trying to expose these grooming gangs and so on and so forth. But really what he's trying to do is just bash Muslims, right? Trying to make, wants to make Muslims look like the root of all evil. And... um, people have a reason to have very good reasons to be skeptical of him. And, um, unfortunately not enough are, but yeah, he's raised a lot of money here in the States. And in fact, when I covered one of these alt right rallies here in Portland, uh, they did a, they did about a 10 minute tribute to Tommy that they said they were going to send him while he was still in prison. Of course, he's not there anymore, but um, yeah. Um, it was sort of astonishing really. The, the, the the people that I spoke to that were just um, set on the fact that it was an anti-free speech thing. And, you know, I'm a strong believer in free speech, you know, I'm not anti-free speech in any way. But it wasn't a free speech issue, it was contempt of court. That's what he was, <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't, they didn't lock him up because they didn't like what he was saying. They locked him up because he wasn't supposed to be reporting on a trial that had reporting restrictions. 
And that, yeah. and that was, it was astonishing to me the, you know, the rallies to get him out and. Oh, just, well, yeah, it got ugly there in London yeah. at uh, one rally. Um, yeah, that was one of the posts I wrote for Haywatch because, yeah, there was a lot of violence around it, which is what we're seeing. I mean, all of these uh, radical right folks are actually just looking for excuses to try to create violent disturbances, and and guys like Robinson give them that. So um, I think we need to understand that uh, these guys actually – um, have zero respect for democracy, that when they talk about free speech, they're only talking about their own free speech. Uh, they certainly have no respect for the free speech rights of the people who are out there opposing them. No. You know, but, those, but you know, those people are out, when they're out there opposing them, they're exercise, exercising their free speech rights too, just as much as the other guys are. So, but they, but they want those, they say, well, you're trying to shut us up. No, we're actually just, uh, countering your bad speech, jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you if uh, if if you think that free speech has become more of a preoccupation of the right rather than the left, but I guess it's only a preoccupation because they are they 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 are playing this oppressed card all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, which, of course, what is one of the things the intellectual dark web likes to do, too, right? Yeah. Claim that there are free speech rights. Look, um, speech, free speech doesn't mean speech without consequences, you know? Yeah. You say awful, hateful stuff, uh, you shouldn't be surprised if people get upset and want to counter that speech. And sometimes what they counter with is, is uh, ugly shouting, but uh, that's... That's kind of in the nature of what you get. And you know what? As uh, somebody who lived in rural uh, America for many years, I can tell you that that the free speech of liberals in these conservative areas is is not any better. Yeah. You know, if you want to get your lights punched out, you can go ahead and speak up. But uh, most pe most people with liberal views keep a low profile in these rural areas because they have to. Yeah. How did you? Um if you so you were raised in that sort of environment mm -hmm. uh, were your yeah. were your family quite liberal on the quiet or um no no my my parents were uh, republicans but they were fairly uh, moderate but we were goldwater republicans um it was just that um i was raised in an area where uh the uh john Burt society was very dominant this was the far reach semi mccarthyite type anti-communist group of the late 50s and 60s. And uh, they basically evolved into Alex Jones. Right. Uh, Alex Jones was a John Bircher. And, um, yeah, they, they were very early in spreading a lot of conspiracy theories. They also evolved into the Clive and Bundys of the world. Uh, most of those views you hear Clive and Bundy express um, are directly descended from this sort of um, John Bircher uh, worldview, the alternative universe they've created for themselves. Um, and so um, I grew up in that environment and I uh, learned to, I, I guess, I, I don't know why I have a, I, I have a slightly contrarian personality, mm. uh, but I spotted it as being utter <laughs> bullshit from the time I was a teenager. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, I, it just smelled like bullshit to me, and I, so I never bought into it. And so I was actually immune at a pretty early age um, with, um, uh, against this sort of conspiracism right. and this sort of right-wing thinking. Um, and, and honestly, a lot of folks on the left do this too. A lot of folks on the left go down – uh, health conspiracies and and uh, you know chemtrails and contrails and and all kinds of as well as you know Caitlin Johnstone I mentioned her she's very much sort of in the on the fringe a lot of the anti Hillary Clinton conspiracy theories that were on the left the pro Bernie conspiracy theories they you know um, they're all of the same uh, form yeah and. 
we need to understand how and why this is happening, too, I think, in addition to having the tools to sort of uh, deal with them. I think it's important to understand that, um, you know, who these, who does this serve? Who, 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 does, who does this tide of conspiracism actually benefit? Because I think you can find or figure it out that, see, one of the things about conspiracy theories is that they feel initially very empowering. Like you've got secret information that nobody else has, right? Oh, sure, yeah. And, and uh, you're, uh, is you, you've, and so you're also not just smarter, but um, able is a step ahead of everybody else. And so it feels initially very empowering. Yeah, they're very easy to but the overall to, to grab you. But, you know, they're kind of oh, yeah. you know, they're exciting. Well, that's they? ooh, that'd be kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah, if that was really true, and then I would know something my friends don't. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, but but. Unfortunately, you know, the overall er narrative arc of conspiracy theories is actually profoundly disempowering because what you once you go down that rabbit hole, what you the universe into which you are plunged is one in which ordinary people have no power. Uh, they're up against forces so dark and nefarious and so deeply entrenched that they really have no chance. And guess what? The tools that we all believe that we have to fight back against these things, namely democracy and our vote, the little political power that we do have, um, is rendered moot. It's null and void in, in this universe. So the eventual endpoint of these of the narrative arc of conspiracism is, you know, it's as you go along, travel along, and eventually you wind up, you know, living in a cabin, survivalist cabin in Montana. Uh, yeah. Cut off from cut off from everybody else, and terribly disempowered as a result. Because you, you know the only power we actually do have in this society is our votes, is yeah. our democratic institutions. Those are what those are the power that we actually have. And if we throw away our democratic institutions, then we've severed ourselves and we've weakened those de those institutions at the same time. Well, guess who that benefits. It benefits the people who are who find uh, democracy incredibly inconvenient. <laughs> that is the wealthy, entrenched powers of the world. And mm. it, I'm not saying that it's an actual conspiracy, but there there actually is. I mean, what conspiracy theories do is they distract us from the very real and very ongoing and and, and just plain right in front of our face things that we know the system that part of the system that we know goes on every day in the world, and that is uh, the cooperative effort by entrenched power and entrenched wealth to maintain their status quo, to maintain their wealth and power, as well as to, in fact, enhance it and increase it at the expense of everyone else, right? This is what we know goes on every single day. And conspiracy theories basically distract us away from even thinking about that reality because instead all of the because those are that that conspiracy that sort of of uh, behavior is actually why we have so many uh social problems i think uh it has a lot to do with why we have bad information in the media i think it has a lot to do with why we have um a lack of social co cohesion and um you know as a result i think we wind up um democracy weakened and this is you know the, the one the one thing that we can do to fight back against the sort of rise of oligarchical powers in the world is to join our arms together and use our democratic institutions to vote and to um you know pass laws that will rein them in and tax them and do the things we need to do to provide for ourselves and make for a decent society. And these are the things that all of these wealthy people just want to take away from us. Quite for, and they're very open about it. There's no disguising it. And this isn't a, this isn't a conspiracy theory. This is what we know goes on in the world. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it, ultimately, one of the things about um, conspiracy theories is 
like all forms of pollution of the information stream, which includes, you know, like Donald Trump's tweets and the claims of fake news. These are actually deliberate attempts to create chaos uh, in the information stream and elsewhere. And um, the point of doing so is um, to increase authoritarianism. Now, when most people think of authoritarianism, they think of the leader at the top, the in this case, Donald Trump, or in Russia's case, Putin. Um, but the reality is that uh, the real story of authoritarianism is the army of authoritarian followers that they create. Uh, because they're actually very different personality types and uh, think different ways and um, have different end goals. Um, but, you know, there's been numerous studies done over the years that have shown that, you know, roughly 20 to 30 percent of the American populace is naturally right wing authoritarian and personality types. Uh, and uh, as and what happens is when you have chaos and uh, in the information stream, it creates fear and uncertainty. Uh, when there's fear and uncertainty in the body politic, um, authoritarianism is a very quick resort and a very common resort psychologically for people to turn to. Um, you know, authoritarianism works off of among the followers, it's built around really three behavioral and attitudinal clusters. Uh, the first is um, authoritarian submission, which is this idea that in order to have a safe and civil and sane society, secure society, uh, everyone must submit to the rule of, of the authoritarian leader. All right. um, the second is authoritarian aggression, which is um, aggression weighed against anyone who fails to appropriately submit to the rule of the authoritarian leader. And then the third is um, conventionalism, this belief that they represent the real uh, national mainstream, uh, the real America in our case, or in your case, the real Britain, the real yeah. England, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, and I'm sure you hear that a lot. You know? Yeah. That's what Tommy Robinson's about, right? Yeah, it's just what he's all about. It's what the, the English Defence League were about. Um, yeah. Yep. It's what Britain so, First are about, who Trump tweeted about that time, you know, retweeted that time. Right. And those and those three clusters uh, create a, will create a whole string of other traits, including, you know, an, uh, a, a, an aptitude to assuming – are believing in conspiracy theories, uh, compartmentalized thinking, uh, the ability to, which includes the ability to believe two completely contradictory things at the same time uh, and engage in acts of what appear to the rest of us to be really naked hypocrisy, but to them is rationalized in their mind because of the compartmentalization in their thinking. Um, it also includes an openness to uh, bigotry and uh, bigoted racial attitudes. Mm. So, um, you know, these are all the traits that that uh, that come out of this sort of interaction. But um, what does happen is that uh, the, the folks who go down, the, you know, who who subscribe to conspiracy theories are very much uh, contributing uh, to. Um, you know, they're very much contributing to this chaos and contributing to this fear and contributing to this authoritarianism. And uh, ultimately, I think it's really toxic for all of us. I would ask, uh, I know this is, you're asked this, I think, in every interview that I, I hear <laughs> you uh, yeah. hear you do, which... Uh, which I always try and avoid, but it does seem like an appropriate follow-up question after that about what what we can do to 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 help mm -hmm. prevent it, mm -hmm. help prevent it sp the spread. Well, I, I I actually do um, approve of people showing up uh, to protest these guys. 
Um, I don't approve of them doing it in an undisciplined fashion and engaging in violence. Uh, I think we, I think, you know, uh, the people who stand up to these guys have to do, do it out of principle. And, uh, unfortunately, a lot of folks on the far left uh, seem to have bought into this notion that words are violence. Mm. And so they they will respond to their vile words uh, with actual violence. And, and I don't think that is helping anyone's cause. It's certainly giving them what they want. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, this is what Nazis have done since the 1920s. You know, that was what the horse vessel lead was about, right? It was about the young German guy who uh, was the martyred at the hands of evil communist violent thugs, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, well that's what they've been doing for a long time. And if you go back, um, there's actually, a, I've got this terrific book from the U.S. Holocaust Museum that they put out about 10 years ago um, of Nazi propaganda uh, with all the posters and stuff in it. Oh. And it's pretty amazing how during that, uh, period of street fighting that the when the brown shirts were mostly engaged in street fighting before uh, they actually ascended to uh, real political power. So much of the uh, propaganda posters were about depicting uh, these noble young brown shirts as martyrs at the hands of violent leftist thugs. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and do that. I know it feels good. I mean, Lord knows Richard Spencer has the world's most punchable <laughs> face. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, what I see him, I want to reach through my screen and, and punch, <laughs> I have to admit. But it doesn't do any good, and it actually nah. helps them. Uh, we need to outsmart these guys. They are very smart. This is the thing I'll give the alt-right. Um, they're a lot smarter in a lot of ways than the folks on the left because the, the folks on the left are so, uh, especially the ones on the very far left, are so caught up in their self-righteousness that they don't understand how they, they certainly have given up on trying to persuade the mainstream, mm. uh, which is one of the really uh, disturbing parts to me. You know, I'll go to these rallies and I'll hear the folks uh, demonstrating against them, uh, chanting, burning, well, I'll see them burning American flags, I'll hear them chanting, America was never great, and so on and so forth, and I think, you know, you're really going to convince all those people out there in middle America that you're, uh, that they want to be on your side, yeah, right, yeah, that yeah. Uh, so um, I think there needs to be discipline. I think there needs to be actually a respect for democracy. And this is unfortunately what, you know, anti-fascists, uh, or not so much anti-fascists, but certainly anarchists, black bloc type folks who are the, really actually are the primary element among the anti-fascists who are engaging in the violence. Uh, those folks are um, um, not, they are, there is, uh, antagonistic towards democracy as these folks on the right are. So, um, you know, I, I think we need to be about democracy. And I think mm -hmm. we need to be about persuading people. And, and actually here in the States, I think we should be all about embracing good old uh, American values, you know, be like Captain America back when he was, <laughs> when he was punching Nazis, you know? Yeah. <laughs> We're about democracy. We're standing up for democracy. And so ultimately, what people can do the most is organize votes. Uh, these are profoundly anti-democratic movements. Uh, uh, and uh, they want to destroy democracy and replace it with an authoritarian state. This is not a joke, and it's not hyperbole. It's actually happening. And it's actually being financed in many regards, as you know, uh, by uh, Russian oligarchs, uh, particularly mm -hmm. in Europe. Uh, we're, we're, we've certainly seen some indications that there is some Russian money flowing into the alt-right here in the States, but uh, it's, it's better, uh, better tracked in Europe that he has been uh, financing a lot of this far-right up stuff. I mean, it's, it's established fact there. So um, at any rate, this is all, you know, uh, if you want to, if you – believe in democracy and you want to continue to have actual political power in the world, uh, you need to get out and defend it. And that includes not just voting yourself, but getting everybody you know out to vote. That's the first step. Uh, 
dealing with the sort of toxic radicalization that's going on is that's boy that's really complicated yeah. and much much harder uh the only thing i've ever seen be effective on pulling these folks out of the rabbit holes is sort of um the personal one-to-one one-on-one relationships uh where you a person can use empathy and their friendship or their love to persuade someone that they care about to you know and it it it's really hard work partly because you have to be really well informed mm. uh in order to do it you have to be able to uh counter their arguments which are almost always predicated on false information but you have to know What's the false information, right? And you have to, sure, yeah. to be able to present the true information. So it's really very hard work. Um, and frankly, it's sometimes not worth it because sometimes they're just such awful people that all they'll do is shit on you. And so um, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I don't really have any big meta answers Except to get Alex Jones off the internet, <laughs> you know that, <laughs> I mean, that's going to do more to actually undermine the spread of conspiracism than any anything that we could do organizedly uh, or, or mm. in any kind of organized fashion or any kind of mass politics fashion. I don't see any kind of mass politics out there yet that uh, can encourage um, individualism and empathy. Uh, simultaneously, uh, you know, libert libertarians love to promote uh, individualism, but they're never about empathy, and they clearly don't care whether people uh, live or die. You know, mm. so uh, at least that's to me the sort of one of the main outcomes of libertarianism. If I read uh, Ayn Rand, um, so yeah, um, so I'm not sure that there are any quick uh fixes on this at all uh, i think yeah. we're really in deep uh and it's going to take a long time for us to get it figured out get it straightened out look one of the most venerable parts of uh the conspiracist world for us has always been uh the people who uh, engage in, in health-related conspiracy theories because one of the oldest conspiracy theories is that the FDA is part of a larger plot by the um, medical community, the AMA and others, who are actually con secretly conspiring to make us sick because they make more money when we get sick. Mm. So they, 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 that that stuff is actually goes back to the eighties, and um, yeah, I mean the the leader, the guy who I used to who originated a lot of the conspiracism that I saw around the militia movement in the nineteen nineties, a a guy named John Trockman, who ran an outfit called the Militia of Montana. Um, he came into it from that original. He was originally a health conspiracy theorist. It's funny you should say about the health conspiracy theories, and you said earlier about how it's it's quite a preoccupation of the left as well, the whole health conspiracy yeah. uh, stuff, because yeah. I was talking to a couple of uh, friends of friends uh -huh. who were very, who were, who were vegans, and then they suddenly started talking about how doctors don't know anything, and... Yeah, and, and exactly as you said, how it's all a ploy to make money for, and I just sort of, I was sort of, you know, slightly taken aback about. Uh huh. So I'm sure, I'm pretty sure doctors do know something. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's why, when we're ill, we go to them, and why they, um, you yeah. know, spend seven years of their lives training to be doctors. It's, yeah, and, I'm, and I'm pretty sure that they actually have made me well from time to time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I think we've got um, pretty empirical evidence that a lot of their stuff does seem to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's what I was saying. All of this stuff depends on people who basically abandon and uh, or, or, or utterly oblivious to 
uh, the basic rules of evidence and factuality. You know, for me, it's second nature because I was a news editor in a newsroom for many years. And so my job was the mm. fact checking and editing and making sure the reporters got their facts straight. And uh, so I, um, any, I mean, the stuff that people are having to learn about the internet now that, you know, actually you need to maybe go and really look something up in or before you actually believe it, or at least yeah. find, find a way to substantiate it one way or another. Uh, second nature to me, but people are now just figuring that out, I think, so. interesting to me how uh, I mean my, my book sold for, has sold very well Alt America has sold very well in Europe yeah uh, I've gotten a fair amount of um, press there I've had real trouble getting press in the US because um, editors are afraid to sort of tackle I mean I put the relationship between Trump and the radical right right in the headline or in the title Mm. And I think that makes a lot of people in the press uncomfortable, not because they can't see that connection, but th they believe that uh, right wingers will descend on them in mass if they. Right. Uh, and, you know, that's actually a legitimate fear. So, yeah, I'm going down to uh, Australia and New Zealand here in a couple of weeks and doing a four city tour um, and very much looking forward to that because I. Well, I, I love Down Under. Um, I did have a great time in Europe this spring. I was in London for about a week. Um, had a cool. had a review or had a couple of events there at London Review Bookshop, and um, um, mostly I just love London because it's a cool city. Yeah. It's a lot of fun to walk around. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I uh, I was an English lit major, so walking right. walking into Westminster Abbey. Like the yeah. chapel, yeah, yeah, my yeah. you know, there's there's my universe right there, you know, yeah, Charles Dickens and Jeffrey Chaucer and yeah, everybody else. So yeah, pretty. So I enjoy do uh, uh, anyway. I just enjoy London quite a bit. Plus, I was a I was a huge um, punk and glam fan back when right. I was young. So I like going to see the David Bowie sites and I like going to see the spots where the Sex Pistols used to play, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. Cool. <laughs> so yeah. Nice. Um so anyway, um it's uh yeah. Um but you know what's happening in England is in the and in the UK generally and as well as I mean all of Europe is very much, uh, we're, it's par very parallel to what we're having to deal with. Um, and obviously in places such as Austria, Italy, and Hungary, um, mm. the desire to, and belief in, the desire to preserve and the belief in democracy uh, has been severely eroded. Uh, I just hope that the rest of the Europe, that the rest of Europe doesn't go down that path. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's. It's, uh, it's a bit trouble. It's it's kind of troubling to be, uh, yeah. to see Britain going the way it is at the moment. Um, well, there's there's always New Zealand. That's true. That's true. <laughs> it's a bit far it. away, but I could yeah. I love it there. It's a beautiful country. I need to. Uh, yeah, I, I need to, to go. I need to go one day. Yeah. 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 Uh, there's a lot of my favorite comedians and stuff are from New Zealand, so. Oh, like Jermaine? <laughs> yeah, and like Reese Darby, and um, yeah, yeah. I saw Flight of the Concords actually uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the O2 in London. They were really good. Oh, you saw Reese? Uh, I saw Jermaine and Brett Flight of the Concords. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Doing a gig, so oh. yeah, they were really good. Yeah, well, and, um, uh, you know, we're very happy for Taika because he. Uh, he had the big hit with the Thor movie. Yeah. Have you uh, seen Hunt for the Wilder People? No, no. I've only seen uh, What We Do in the Shadows and Boy. Ah, uh, so. Hunt for the Wilder People uh, is the film he did before the Thor film. Uh-huh. And it's 
I, I, I generally stay away from recommending films because, you know, it's, it's always it's, a difficult one. Mm-hmm. But, but that is just such a beautiful... It's funny. It's... Yeah, it's... And if you like Taika Waititi... Quite a bit. You'll love Hunt, you'll love Hunt for the World of People. It's, it's great. It's really good. Okay, cool. So I'll check I it out. I recommend that. So there you have it, David Nywert. My thanks to David for doing the show, and uh, my thanks to you, the listener, for listening to the show. Um, we'll be back next time uh, with another interesting conversation, this time uh, with two people, um, Harold Grosskopf and Eberhard uh, Kraneman. Uh, Eberhard, of course, uh, an early member of Craftwork, and Harold... Um, of the cult album Synthesis fame. Um, they're both on the show next time uh, talking about their new venture, Krautwerk. And uh, jolly interesting chat it is as well, so make sure you tune back next time. Um, for now, uh, what you can really do to really help me out is to go and leave a little rating and a review on uh, iTunes or Spotify or wherever you're listening to this podcast. And uh, and then maybe, if you, you know, if you really want to, you could go over to patreon.com forward slash the last line and donate some money to the show. Um, that would be nice. Um, be a little treat, wouldn't it? Um, and, and you'd get something out of it as well. As you will see if you go to Patreon, there's, there's rewards for doing so so i don't see why you wouldn't want to really um but of course thank you for listening it's much appreciated you do wonder if if uh if you're just talking to yourself sometimes that's uh, it's a dark thought to have so until next time i've been james alban and this is the last line